Hello and welcome to I Know Dino. I'm Garrett. And I'm Sabrina. Today, in our 301st episode, we have Dinosaur of the Day Bambi Raptor and a bunch of news, including a confirmed ovary in several dinosaurs, not just one dinosaur. Ooh. It's pretty amazing. Definitely one of the most difficult to find soft tissues I can imagine. <laughs> mm-hmm. But gives a lot of information. Yes. But before we get into all that, real quick, we want to thank some of our patrons. And this week, we'd like to thank Blue Gollimer, Jackson Crawford, Bilal, Richard, Stego Sophie, Kelly, Ayrton and Everett, Chris, Greg, and Mellow Stego. And I also want to give a huge thank you to Cameron, who is our first Spinosaurus patron, which means we're going to be sending you a metal print of Sabrina's parading Parasaurolophi Parasaurolophuses <laughs> shortly. Might just be Parasaurolophus. Yeah, it definitely is. You're right. Yeah, but thank you so much. We really appreciate all of your support, and it's so awesome to see. And if you want to join our growing community, then check out our page, patreon.com slash inodino. We've got all kinds of rewards. Up first in the news, we've got that dinosaur found with ovarian follicles. It was published in Communications Biology and written by Alita Bayuel and Jingmei O'Connor, as well as many other co-authors. But we've interviewed both of them before about soft tissues in dinosaurs, and they're the two first authors on the paper. So... I figured that was worth mentioning. The beginning of the abstract is pretty astonishing. They say, quote, the remains of ovarian follicles reported in nine specimens of basal birds, end quote. So nine specimens. That's a ridiculous number of dinosaurs that have been found with ovaries. Ridiculously good. Yes. Usually when we're talking about these kind of things, it's just one specimen. I can't remember any time where we've seen soft tissue and in one paper it's been described in more than one specimen, let alone nine <laughs> specimens is crazy. Sometimes with embryos, they'll find like one or two eggs, maybe three if you're lucky, but nine is like a whole other level. So these are all from the J-hole biota in northeast China, and that area in particular is really great for soft tissues. They've been reported over the last couple decades, including feathers, lungs, which we talked about with Jing Mei O'Connor back in episode 206, also cartilage and skin, and not in the J-hole, but a similar age in Western China, there's an egg-bound dinosaur that Alita talked about in an interview with us back in episode 227. And in episode 279, we talked about preserved DNA fragments with her as well. So this group is working on a lot of really controversial, <laughs> in some cases, soft tissue findings all over the dinosaur record in China. Yeah, some really cool stuff. Yes. So back to the nine ovaries, they found one in Jehol Ornus, one in Eo Confucius Ornus, and, quote, seven specimens of enantiornithines, end quote. They didn't specify which seven specimens of enantiornithines, if they're all different species or just one species. It might have been in the supplemental material, but I didn't see it. And that means they are all very bird-like between those two species plus unnamed in antiornithines. They probably all had teeth too, except for Eo Confucius Ornus, because Confucius Ornithids are known for their lack of teeth that makes them maybe a little bit more bird-like on a superficial level. So in order to test to see if this was in fact an ovary or just a blotch <laughs> of some other sort on the fossil, because whenever soft tissue preserves, it's more like a really faint outline of what preserved or maybe just a dark coloration it's not like a bone where you can pop it out and feel it and measure it in all sorts of ways it always gets flattened and usually there's not much left of it so what they did was they used histology probably not surprising if you're familiar with some of their other work basically what they did is they cut off a really thin slice of it and then put it in a microscope after adding some paraffin to it for all of their destructive tests, they used one of the enantiornithines. I guess it makes sense if they have seven of them mm -hmm. <laughs> to want to destroy one of the only ones of the other species. And in addition to doing histology with the paraffin, they also demineralized a sample for chemical analysis. Like we talked about in episode 279 with those DNA fragments, if you can separate 
the soft tissue from the rock by basically dissolving away the rock, then you can really get in there and do a better chemical analysis than you can by just looking at it or looking at it under fluorescing light or something. At the end of the day, they combined these histological tests with some chemical analyses, and they said that the ovaries appear to be, quote, smooth muscle fibers, collagen fibers, and blood vessels, end quote. And they found that that was similar to the perifollicular membrane, or PFM, of modern birds. And PFM are tissue of pre-ovulatory ovarian follicles that you see in birds. In other words, the follicle is partially developed, including some yolk, but hasn't left the ovary or ovulated yet, thus the pre-ovulatory. So it's still in development, and there's no shell at this point. Hmm. So very early on. Yes. The main alternative hypothesis, because obviously not everyone accepted that these were definitely ovaries when they first saw them in a fossil, a lot of people thought that they might have been something that the dinosaur ate or something that washed into the gut, like a seed. However, when they compared the chemical analyses and looked at it under a microscope, it didn't look like plant tissue to them. It looked a lot more like that PFM part of a modern bird. In every one of the nine samples that they looked at, there was only one ovary, and modern birds also only have one ovary. So this might point to the origin of this one ovary feature that we see in modern birds. And since the J-hole biota is about 120 to 130 million years old, this shared trait may date all the way back to that point in history. So going back to when dinosaurs went extinct, non-avian dinosaurs, that's only getting you half of the way back to this point in time. Wow. Yeah. So they might have had this one ovary feature way, way way back in the early Cretaceous. Well, it keeps them lighter. It does. So that's really the main benefit that we think birds and dinosaurs got from this feature. And they think, since these are also some of the very first flying ancestors to modern birds, that it might have really been one of the first features that they evolved, this lighter weight from only having the one ovary. Another really cool and interesting thing about these follicles is that they're all about the same size relative to their body size. In other words, there aren't larger ones and smaller ones within the ovaries. And modern birds have multiple follicles as well when they're growing eggs, but they tend to be at different sizes. And they say that's linked to the higher metabolism and frequent laying that modern birds do. So they propose there was no, quote, follicular hierarchy, end quote, in Jeholornis and in Antiornithines, which might indicate a lower metabolism in those dinosaur birds. Hmm. However, Eo Confucius Ornus may have had a bit of that follicular hierarchy, and that might show that Confucius Ornithiforms had a higher metabolism, which I guess has been proposed previously. I'm not really up on the whole Confucius Ornithiform metabolism <laughs> discussion, but... Yeah, if we can find this in other fossilized dinosaur birds, we might be able to see like when their metabolism changed as well as when they reduced down to one ovary. Super cool study, as always, for these soft tissue findings. And I'm sure there's going to be more interpretations that we can get out of this and learn as the other eight get studied in more depth. Yeah, definitely a lot of new and exciting information that'll be coming out. In other news, thanks to Keith who shared this one with us, so in Scotland on the Isle of Egg, Dr. Elsa Pancaroli found the first dinosaur bone from Scotland that's not from the Isle of Skye. Hmm. And it happened one day she was running to catch up with her team. They were out looking for marine reptiles and fish fossils, which were the only fossils previously found on that island. And she kind of stumbled upon it and realized, hey, this looks different. And it turned out to be a stegosaur bone from the Middle Jurassic. Wow. Yeah, so now the fossil's in the collections of the National Museum of Scotland in Edinburgh. That's really cool. I'm surprised that they hadn't found any dinosaur fossils outside of the island of Skye in Scotland before. I didn't realize that. Same, although when I think back to what we've talked about, it's always the Isle of Skye. It is, <laughs> yeah. I think we talked about some stegosaur tracks on the Isle of Skye at one point. Mm. Which is nice that now they've found a bone. Maybe they can start to piece together what kind of stegosaur it was. Yeah. We've got a quick fun excavation story. So David Schmidt and a team excavated a large triceratops skull in the South Dakota Badlands over two months this summer in June and July. And thanks to Paul for sharing this one with us. So the triceratops skull, I believe, is nicknamed Shady. So a local rancher had found the horn 
a long cylindrical bone in March of 2019 and then reported it because it was on public land along the boundary of the Grand River National Grassland, so he wasn't allowed to collect it. Schmidt and his team arrived shortly after for their annual digging trip, so very fortuitous, and eventually they got the green light to collect the fossils after it was confirmed that, yes, this was found within the park's boundaries. So the skull's about seven feet long. It weighs over 3,000 pounds. Mm -hmm. I couldn't find how much of the skeleton is around, but the team has collected a lot of bones, and now they're working on preparing their finds. Well, if it's only seven feet long, it's not big enough to settle the Taurosaurus being an adult Triceratops debate, because that's still firmly within the Triceratops could be a juvenile Taurosaurus. I remember John Scanella describing it as the size of a car. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that seven feet is too small to be a car. Yeah, a small car. That's a really, that's like a smart car. <laughs> uh, <laughs> they exist. I guess. <laughs> In Tatenhill, Hill, England, people can visit the National Forest Adventure Farm, which is holding a dino summer event on its 40 acres, and that includes a nine-acre maze. So there you can pet a T-Rex, go on a raptor run, and that's where you go to the middle of the maze, which is made out of maze, <laughs> hmm. and you're handed a velociraptor egg. So then a velociraptor enters the maze trying to get her eggs back. The fact that it's a velociraptor in a corn maze reminds me a lot of Jurassic Park with that scene where they're in the tall grass that looks kind of like tall corn. Oh, yeah. Or it was in The Lost World, actually, not in the original Jurassic Park, where they're all running through the fields and then they show it from above and there's velociraptors running after them. Oh, yeah. And you see the tails. Converging. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> I wonder if that's what they were inspired by. Or by Jurassic World 3 when they stole the eggs from velociraptor. Oh, true. Yeah. Maybe all of the above. There's other activities. You can feed animals like cows, goats, and alpacas. There's sheep races and mm -hmm. cart racing. Uh, of course, to keep people safe, passes are split between morning and afternoon slots. And the event is open every day until September 1st. I've never heard of sheep races before, but I feel like every rural area that has livestock races them mm -hmm. periodically. I've seen so. pig races. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Why not? The Velociraptor maze sounds fun. Yeah, the Velociraptor entering the maze. I don't, it must be somebody in a costume or something. Oh, it is, yeah. <laughs> Could be really scary if you go around a corner in a maze and there's a Velociraptor right in your face. Yes, I could see that. Even if it is just a costume. In other news, Dino, the Apatosaurus building at 5299 Commercial Way in Spring Hill, Florida, is now officially listed in the National Register of Historic Places. And we talked before about it going through the process. So now it is through the process. Yeah, the one that's a, it's like a Apatosaurus building in air quotes. It's mm -hmm. more like a covering above a building. Right, but it's in that shape. Yeah. There's also a story of a mom who decorated her son's bedroom with a large sauropod painting on the wall, and she did it by outlining the sauropod shape on the wall in pencil, and then she covered that outline with duct tape, and then painted the inside of the dinosaur with these geometric shapes that mm. were also outlined by the tape. And each shape had its own color, so it looks really pretty. That does sound cool. I hope she used masking tape and not duct tape. It said duct tape, but maybe it was masking tape. <laughs> That's ill-advised to use on walls while painting. <laughs> Whatever you need to do to get a dinosaur on the wall, though, I guess. Mm. So in Jurassic Park and Jurassic World tidbits, uh, according to Insider, there's a moment in Jurassic Park in the movie where you can see one of the crew members of the film grabbing a raptor's tail. And it's the scene where the raptor is opening the door to the kitchen you know, the one with the raptors, they end up chasing Lex and Tim. And I saw the clip. You can see the person's hand for a split second. And I wouldn't have noticed it if someone hadn't pointed it out. But since they did, now I can't not see it. Is it in the beginning of the scene or where is it in there? Yeah, right right when the door is opening. Oh, okay. Like they're positioning it right so it can get through the door or something. Something like that, yeah. <laughs> That's funny. In Jurassic World news, Jurassic World Dominion has been posting some photos on Instagram lately, and one of them's a set of three photos that shows behind the scenes on set while they're filming. And in that second photo, you see someone wearing a mask while touching some baby dinosaurs that are in a cage. It's pretty cute. So now we know that there's going to be some baby dinosaurs in the movie. Nice. You need baby dinosaurs. Mm -hmm. That means that they're breeding, too. True. And then they spread. The lysine contingency isn't working. <laughs> <laughs> 
Minecraft is now working with Jurassic World. There's an official Jurassic World DLC, downloadable content, and players can be managers of Jurassic Park. There's more than 60 dinosaurs, and you have the ability to find dinosaur DNA. Based on the trailer, it looks like they have a lot of features and characters from Jurassic Park as well. I think there's Lex and Tim, for example. That's cool. Yes, Spino Breaker posted it on our Discord, and I I said I was tempted to switch our ARC server to a Minecraft server, because as a reminder, we have an ARC server for all of our patrons uh, through the Steam version of ARC, so if you are a patron, you can play ARC with us. But after hearing a little bit more about it, I'm not as excited, because Tarkia Tamer described it as Jurassic Park if nothing went wrong, (laughs) which just, I mean, I guess it's cool, you've got dinosaurs in a in a park but it seems like that would get old pretty quickly right <laughs> apparently there are also some glitches maybe if the glitches are just right and they start attacking you that would make it exciting again mm. <laughs> but it's probably more like dinosaurs falling through the minecraft world or something and last we've got another quick item about google chrome's hidden dinosaur game This comes up as a news item so often. So (laughs) there's now a modded version called Dino Swords that gives the T-Rex weapons to use against the cacti and pterodactyls. (laughs) And in some of the images that I've seen, the T-Rex is riding a tank, holding a baseball bat, holding a pill. I guess it poisons the pterodactyl. Anyway, it also is shown holding a bow and arrow and a lot more. Apparently some of the items will damage your T-Rex Maybe it's the one where the T-Rex is smoking a cigarette. I don't know exactly which one. <laughs> this one where it's smoking. Yeah. I didn't realize there was health. I thought it was just like all or nothing. It's a real uh, extensive addition to the game. Definitely. <laughs> well, it adds a lot more layers to it. Pretty soon it's going to be like full Mario where you jump up and you can hit a mushroom and grow into a bigger T-Rex. Maybe evolve into something. Mm, into something smaller that flies. Yeah. Like a pigeon. (laughs) You survived the extinction. And now on to our dinosaur of the day, Bambi Raptor, which was a request from Frodo Swaggins via our Discord and Patreon. So thanks. Bambi Raptor was a dromaeosaur theropod that lived in the late Cretaceous in what is now Montana in the U.S. in the Two Medicine Formation. It was very bird-like. It had a narrow snout and it had a wishbone that looked similar to modern birds. It also had long arms and a long, stiff tail. The tail may have curved upwards, but it could just look like that based on how the fossils were preserved. Bambi Raptor had long hind limbs, so it was probably a fast runner, and it had sickle-shaped claws. It may have had feathers. No feathers have been found with the fossils, but close relatives of Bambi Raptor have been found with feathers. Proportionally, Bambi Raptor was similar to Archaeopteryx. The type species is Bambi Raptor feinbergi. The holotype is nicknamed Bambi, and it was nicknamed by Wes Linster, the 14-year-old boy who discovered the dinosaur. He found the skeleton in 1993 when looking for dinosaurs with his parents near Glacier National Park in Montana. So the genus name is actually because of the specimen's nickname, Bambi. And the genus name means Bambi Caesar or Bambi Thief. Oh no, it went from being Bambi to being Bambi's murderer. (laughs) (laughs) I guess so. The species name is in honor of Michael and Anne Feinberg, who purchased the fossils and then lent them to the Graves Museum of Natural History in Florida. Bambi Raptor was described and named by David Burnham and others in 2000, and the skeleton's about 95% complete. Wow, that's really good. Yes. Well, so because the skeleton was so complete, it's been called the Rosetta Stone of Raptors, (laughs) and John Ostrom called it a jewel. The right side of the skeleton is damaged, but the rest is in good condition, though there's no end of the tail. Bambi Raptor was first thought to be a juvenile Sorornitholestes, and then later thought to be a new Velociraptor species, Velociraptor feinbergi. Bambi Raptor does help show the link between non-avian dinosaurs and birds. The holotype's probably a juvenile, it's less than 3 feet or 1 meters long, and it weighed about 4.4 pounds or 2 kilograms. Just a little guy. Yeah. I guess like Bambi. Yeah, and the skull was small too, only 5 inches or 13 centimeters long. There are also referred specimens that include two adults that were found near the holotype and an upper jawbone, but only the juvenile specimen's been described. Gregory Paul estimated Bambi raptor adults to be 4.3 feet or 1.3 meters long and weigh 11 pounds or 5 kilograms. So even as an adult, it was smaller than a velociraptor. That is a little guy. Mm-hmm. 
The holotype for Bambi Raptor had a large brain for its body, but that could be because it was a juvenile. It had a larger ratio of brain to body. Or it could also mean it was more intelligent than other dromaeosaurs. There's uh, hypotheses that include that it lived in trees or it hunted more agile prey like lizards and mammals. It probably did eat small mammals and reptiles. Bambi Raptor may have been able to reach its mouth with its hands, so it could have put food into its mouth with its hands. It actually had opposable fingers. Hmm. Phil Center found that Bambi Raptor could hold prey in both of its arms and then bring its food to its mouth and also touch the tips of its first and third fingers together. Wow. They used fossils and casts of Deinonychus and Bambi Raptor forelimb bones to test this. So, again, Bambi Raptor may have been able to grab its prey, kill it with its claws, and then feed itself. Well, put the food into its mouth with its hands. Oh, and it may have also used its sickle claws on its second toes to kill prey. As you'd expect for a dromaeosaur. Mm-hmm. Center, however, found that Bambi Raptor wouldn't have been able to dig. If Bambi Raptor had feathers, its feathers may have gotten in the way of the hands, though Center said that he thought the hands may have extended beyond the feathers, if there were feathers. The description of Bambi Raptor in 2000 said that the holotype may have been male, based on its chevrons being similar to those in male crocodilians, but it's not clear. It's not like seeing ovaries or... <laughs> yeah. The holotype of Bambi Raptor was found with hadrosaurs, probably myosaurus, as well as at least three tyrannosaurid specimens. And our fun fact of the day goes back to dinosaur ovaries, because they are amazing. So I mentioned earlier that birds only have one ovary, and it's always the left one. <laughs> the right one is still technically there, but it's tiny and undeveloped. However, in some birds, the right ovary is still present. So we always say birds only have one ovary. When did that happen? Turns out some birds have both ovaries because anytime you make a statement about biology always being one way, there's got to be an exception. So hmm. I really just should never say always from now on, but I'm sure I will make that mistake again. As a fun quick aside, platypuses also only have one functioning ovary and it is also the left ovary. Just adding another element to platypuses being the strangest mammals by far. <laughs> Why? Why only the one ovary? I guess they lay eggs, so maybe it, somehow it helps. They don't need to fly. I don't know what kind of weight savings. There's got to be some other reason than just weight saving that these animals are benefiting from. Yeah. That the platypus does it too. If you're wondering which birds do have two ovaries, for a long time, people apparently have known that kiwis have two ovaries that function. Hmm. It's weird because kiwis have the largest eggs proportional to their body size of any animal. We talked about that before. If you look at an x-ray of a kiwi bird, when it's got an egg inside it, it's like half of its body is egg. It's so huge, the eggs these things lay. Other than kiwis, the other birds that have two ovaries all fly, which is strange. I kind of thought after seeing kiwis, oh, okay, you know, they're land dwelling they don't need the weight savings even though platypus clearly lost an ovary for some reason <laughs> but maybe you know it'd be like an ostrich or a moa or something but no it's raptors hmm. meaning the flying predatory birds specifically it's been confirmed in four species that i could find in peer-reviewed articles there's the long-eared owl the common buzzard the sparrow hawk and the goshawk which i think were selected they looked at a whole bunch of different birds i think they selected those because they're from different groups that paper didn't really go into why they thought these birds had two ovaries and i don't know if maybe you can explain it by them being on a different branch of birds that never lost a functioning right ovary, but I'm guessing it's more likely that it came back at a different point, especially since that earlier paper was pointing to the very early birds, 120, 130 million years ago, losing a functioning right ovary. So you'd presume that if the ancestors all had this shared trait, they would have had to re-evolve a functioning right ovary, which isn't too crazy because birds still have a right ovary, it's just not functioning. So maybe it's not that big of a deal. A couple fun ovary facts, because ovaries are amazing. All vertebrates have really similar ovaries, including fish, dinosaurs, mammals, everything that is a vertebrate. We all have pretty much the same ovaries if we're female. I was going to say we all? Yeah, okay. <laughs> I wish I had ovaries. They're so cool. So <laughs> at least I don't know of any exceptions. I shouldn't say all vertebrates have ovaries because, again, I just pointed out that there's an exception to every rule. But every vertebrate that I could find has ovaries. 
There are many species of parasitic worms that live off of the ovaries of both ocean and freshwater fish, too. They are terrifying. I can't imagine. The ocean is my nightmare, and I'm really glad we don't live in the ocean and have to deal with things like ovarian worms. But some fish only have the right ovary rather than just the left ovary like birds have, or they just have one ovary that's been formed by the two fusing together as an embryo. So there are fish with just one ovary that are a super ovary of the combination of the two ovaries. They just wanted to be different from birds. (laughs) I guess so. So I'm I'm just going to jump in as somebody who has ovaries. In humans, those of us with ovaries, we're born with every egg that we ever will have. It's a large number of eggs that we're born with. That's a little bit misleading because Actually, there's millions of ovarian follicles and not eggs that are ready to be fertilized. But once you reach puberty, one or more of those follicles grows a lot. And then eventually an egg comes out. And those follicles, they all grow at different rates and they can grow simultaneously. Yeah, so it's it's basically the same in birds, except that the egg ends up growing so large while in the ovary that it actually distorts the shape of the ovary. You can see it like bulging out of the side of the ovary. You can see it a little bit in human ovaries as well in the very last stage where it's getting to the largest size, but it's just kind of a small bump compared to this big old crazy thing that you get on birds. And if you've ever seen a picture of a bird ovary, it is crazy because it's covered in all these yolks basically in different sizes and stages of development. And then eventually once it makes it this way farther down and it's ejected from the ovary, it'll start to calcify and turn into what looks a lot more like an egg you'd be familiar with. It's kind of fun because we've understood bird and dinosaur ovulation way longer than we've understood human ovulation. <laughs> there was There were all these crazy theories about where humans came from. Most of them derived from something similar to a homunculus, which was the idea that there were these little tiny, fully formed humans, probably sperm, and then they went into the female and then developed. So Mm. it didn't involve eggs at all because obviously they couldn't see what was going on in ovaries, whereas in dinosaurs and birds, it's really obvious with all these yolks and everything all over the place. There's also the dinosaur bird theory that the stork brought the baby. <laughs> That's true. They've long been a symbol of fertility since we actually understood how their reproductive cycle worked, unlike our own. <laughs> I just think it's kind of fun that we knew how dinosaur ovulation worked before we even knew what dinosaurs were, and we didn't even know how our own reproductive system really worked. So going back to human eggs, in humans, older eggs can be less viable. So nowadays you can get them frozen. And some people are starting to freeze their follicles, which is a piece of the ovary. And oftentimes that happens when people are getting medical treatments that could damage the ovaries. So, for example, chemotherapy. Yeah, you might not have time to do the whole take the right drugs to make a bunch of eggs and then freeze those eggs separately. So they can much more quickly freeze a section of the ovary and then they can reattach it later and it'll start reproducing eggs again. Or even crazier is you can put it in a mouse and it'll produce follicles. What? Yeah. So you can modify a mouse so it doesn't have the immunobodies to reject human tissue. And then you can stick part of a human (laughs) ovary onto the mouse ovary, I I assume. And then it'll produce the human eggs. And I think you can take them out that way. When I hear crazy things like this, I think of Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy and how the mice are secretly running experiments (laughs) by being experimented on. Yeah, like they secretly all along wanted to give birth to mouse-human hybrids or something. (laughs) Yeah. What I think of when I hear it is this is one step closer for me being able to grow a fetus inside me because that sounds amazing and I'm really (laughs) envious of everyone who can do that because what cooler science thing is there to do than to create a, a creature inside you? But then I think of that Arnold Schwarzenegger movie and who knows what happens. (laughs) Yeah, the getting it out part is tricky. And I don't, yeah, but it's still cool. I'm really hopeful about where the science goes. Even though from birth, human ovaries at least have every egg that they will ever need throughout their lifetime, the male side of that equation does not work nearly as cleanly because We need so much more sperm throughout our lives that it would be really impractical to have all of that 
until it needs to be used. And similarly, apparently some animals require too many eggs for it to be practical for them to be born with a lifetime supply. Hmm. Yeah, so they generate new follicles throughout their life. And apparently this includes fish and amphibians, but I couldn't find specific examples of which ones because I was curious just how many eggs are these animals producing that millions (laughs) is not enough. Well, if you think about fish can produce hundreds or maybe even thousands of eggs at once. Yeah, I think you're right that there's like some kind of fish that lays a whole bunch of eggs and then the male sprays a bunch of sperm out and they kind of meet in like the ocean water Mm -hmm. and some of them survive and that's the strategy. So I I suppose they would need to produce a lot of eggs. Yeah, (laughs) that sounds familiar, but I'm not, but I don't know that much about fish. Yeah, but that's just an example of You know, you tend to think ovaries have all the eggs you ever need. But of course, there's an example in nature where, no, they're creating more eggs, just like producing extra sperm all the time. So to summarize, ovaries are amazing. Not surprisingly, they've been conserved through hundreds of millions of years of evolution. And they're very similar in us and dinosaurs and fish and just about everything else with a spinal cord. Guess that means they work pretty well. Yeah. And that wraps up this episode of Vino Dino. Thanks for listening. Don't forget to subscribe in your favorite podcast app so you don't miss out on any new episodes. And please join our growing community, patreon.com slash Thanks again. And until next time. Good day.